In this episode of another Zelda podcast, David tells Kate the story of the making of Ocarina of Time. Hello and welcome to another Zelda podcast. I am David Geisler and I'm here with my co-host Kate May. Kate, how are you? That's me. I'm good. We're kind of going classic here. This is a classic Saturday morning recording session. Almost all of season one was done this way. Obviously, season two got a little more complicated. Yep. This but... is an old school sesh. Old school sesh. I'm recording indeed, indeed. a couple episodes today here in my dining room back in the normal location. Your pup is at daycare? My puppy is at daycare today, so she will not be barking in the background like on the last episode that you may have heard her. I don't know if it, it came through. F- fine. Like you heard her. It wasn't it didn't break the show. We <laughs> acknowledged it a few times. She's adorable. She's amazing, but uh she is at daycare, so she has more fun that way and she doesn't have to worry about what mom is up to and why isn't mom paying attention to me and where's mom and what's mom doing and, and mommy, 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 mommy. See. Um, but yeah, I love her. And then when she comes back from daycare, she's like a little exhausted angel. So Ooh, there's it's that. a double benefit. So we get to do our recording today and she gets mm-hmm. to play with her puppy friends and then she is all tuckered out at the end of the day and we don't have to chase her around the house. That's I like great. that. My sister who has uh, three kids, two of them, my nieces have been on one episode of this show. Mm-hmm. Um, she was telling me the importance of strategic playtime mm-hmm. so as to have the kids have less energy when like bedtime comes around and stuff like that. Yes. And it's very interesting. Puppies, though, will will not understand that they're supposed to be getting tired. They'll just get really <laughs> riled up, which kids can sometimes do, too. Yeah. Like, they'll just get more hyper when you're like, no, 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 this is not this was not my intention. I don't want that. So you have to, like, kind of teach them how to lay down then after a bit. And, like, when they do, you have to be like, oh, my God, you're the best dog ever. Good girl. Oh, oh, oh like positive enforcement. Yep. They're like, oh, this is a thing I'm supposed to do. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Can't be that. Anyway, this has been Puppy Hour. With yeah. Kate and Dave. I like touching in. I like, I, you know, we, we, you and I, we, well, I guess we've seen each other a little bit more recently because of all the crazy recordings, but yeah. sometimes we don't see each other for like six weeks. Yeah, gotta um, catch up. So it's nice to catch up. So let's see. Today I am, today is going to be a fantastic episode. I have a tremendous amount of listener feedback. Some relates directly to our previous episodes. So okay. normally I try to read our listener feedback in chronological order, but I'm going to jump forward to some uh, favorite side quest stuff. Cool. Because it was so relevant. We got so much feedback. And then I'll probably do a little bit of chronological stuff. But um, today, Kate, for the episode, people maybe don't exactly know what this episode will be about because I'm definitely titling it Zelda 64. Mm. So this is a making of episode. This is an episode just like in season one. I did it for the original Legend of Zelda uh, game. Um, I did a a fair amount of research and collected as much information as I could. And I put together a bit of a report here to give you of what I've learned about the making of Ocarina of Time. Yeah. And somewhat infamously or perhaps famously, the original title when it was first shown as a tech demo was Zelda 64. Because everything had to be something 64. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I remember when they changed it to Ocarina of Time, I was like, what? How will I know what system this is for? <laughs> What is it? What is this game? It's true. It's so, so confusing. We will dive in deep. I have tons of notes. Um, I can't wait to talk about it. But first, let's uh, let's hearken back to one episode ago. Oh, mm-hmm. Twilight Princess side quests. Yes, indeed. Favorite side quests and Twilight Princess. Tons of feedback. So I'm just going to go through. Well, I've got about five or six here, which I thought was really cool. Um, I'll get to it. So over on YouTube, as soon as we posted this episode, as of this recording, Kate, this episode only came out about a week ago Mm -hmm. on YouTube. So we already got quite a bit of feedback. I think, you know, side quests, it's interesting because everybody, Twilight Princess is a big game. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to side quests, people, you know, everyone, I'm joking right now, but has to enjoy the main quests because you have to play them. Right. But side quests (laughs) are like the special little pieces of of seasoning that uh, people may enjoy some more than others in the rest. Right, or they might not even know about some because we we certainly didn't know about a couple of them. Mm-hmm. So here's something. Uh, Krillin Dude, K-R-I-L-L-I-N Dude over on YouTube. A lot of YouTube comments for this one. Uh, Krillin Dude for Favorite Side Quests said, uh, it's actually confirmed in Hyrule Historia or somewhere in an interview that the Skull Knight that teaches you moves is the link from Ocarina of Time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think we might have touched upon that. Um, on a different in, episode? In, probably in the Twilight. Princess review episode, 
but um, yeah, because I remember talking about <laughs> dad. Thanks yes. for teaching me these this stuff, dad. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's cool. I like little Easter eggs like that in the games. Thank you so much for vamping while I took a drink of water. Oh, no problem. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's gonna lull, and the and the professional that you are, you're like, I will continue this sentence. I did not know you were drinking water. I was just talking. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm glad that uh, oh, I'm, that is wonderful. I made it seem professional. Yeah, it's just becoming organic now. Yep, you're getting so used to podcasting. I'm really good at it. <laughs> Over on Patreon, Celeste Roberts, our blog editor, oh, girl. Uh, she yeah, indeed, she commented and she chimed in. She said, "Fishing in Twilight Princess is so serene. I used to enjoy just rowing around the lake, and that is something that I used to do. Yeah. I, I think I rowed around the lake more than I fished, honestly." Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was, that was a wonderful experience. Just enjoying the scenery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Anna loves crafts. She often leaves us messages. She, I assume, often leaves us messages on YouTube. I've definitely read some in the past, but for favorite side quests, she chimed in and said, the Western Hidden Village, so the mm -hmm. little shootout village, mm -hmm. the Western Hidden Village actually becomes a mini game once the main purpose is fulfilled. I actually, it was a bit of a mistake that I made. I assumed that that shootout was a side quest. I thought of it as a side quest, but you do have to do it. Mm. So she says mm. here, um, Wolflink can find a cuckoo hanging out in the <clears throat> village. Talking to it will activate a mini game that is pretty much hide and seek with the cats. I never did that. Oh. I don't think I ever did. That sounds vaguely familiar. I might have done that. Yeah. So it's almost like you're still sneaking up, but you're probably sneaking up on cats as a dog instead <laughs> of sneaking up on bo bokoblins or whatever, yeah. or goblins. Uh, Joseph Murray then uh, said over on Favorite Side Quests in Twilight Princess, he said, I always loved how in this game you could almost forget the story with all of the side quests. Mm -hmm. You could just go out and hunt golden bugs and explore the overworld. Yep, pretty much. I really enjoyed this comment, Joseph Murray, because as Twilight Princess is absolutely one of my favorite Zelda games. When we started this podcast, it was my favorite Zelda game. Mm -hmm. Um but one criticism that I often have for Twilight Princess is how linear it is. Right. And I have to remember that when it came out, the fact that Twi the, the fact that Hyrule Field did actually stream in little chunks, it was it was flirting with being an open world mm -hmm. by going to these different areas and having a streaming loading engine and stuff like that. It is easy for even me to forget that there really was a tremendous amount of time that you can spend in Twilight Princess just doing other stuff. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I want to play that game again now. I know. <laughs> we got to get through A Link to the Past first. I know, I know. <laughs> um, um, and and plenty of other games. Right. But eventually. I know. It'll be like, I'm just so joking many. right now, but like season six will be like, Twilight Princess, revisit it. <laughs> <laughs> Played for the 50th time. Yep, indeed. Uh, favorite side quest in Twilight Princess, Malcolm Howard over on YouTube said, I've been playing this game for years, and I found this about three months ago. In Hyrule Field, there's a bombable wall that leads to more of the sliding block, block puddle, puddles, puzzles, I'm getting tongue-tied, sliding block puzzles from Yido and Yida's mansion dungeon. Oh. It yields a piece of heart. And it's my new favorite side quest puzzle. So somewhere in Hyrule Field, there's a bombable wall that leads to more, you know, probably the sliding ice block. The ice blocks, stuff. yeah. I kind of love those puzzles. Huh. We got to find that now. Depends on my mental state if I love those or not. Like if I'm in a good mood, I'll be like, okay, I'll do this. And if I've like, if I'm super tired and I've just had it, I'm like, no, no not these. I had my favorite kind of puzzles in Zelda games or maybe anywhere are spatial puzzles. Mm hmm. And so I love, I always enjoy those sliding, sliding block puzzles. Oh, uh, I might have one more. No, this is a conversation that happened for um, our Breath of the Wild episode. So, so with all that, thank you so much for the feedback. Yeah. I feel like there was one or two more that maybe I didn't get through, get in here. Do you want me to vamp for time? <laughs> uh, let me just kind of scroll real quick. See, I'm vamping. This is scrolling music. Yes. Bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> Uh, no, there was a few others. If I remember correctly, there's actually a few others that popped up, which maybe I didn't, I'll have to go search a little bit that mentioned, um, some other side quests and, and things like that. But anyway, thank you so much for all that feedback. Yeah. Um, I love, that's my favorite kind of feedback is when people essentially chime in. Yeah. With and tell us what said. they've done. Continue the conversation. Yeah. Fun facts. So let's Anecdotes. Do, let's do some classic listener feedback now real quick, Kate. Cool. Uh, over on YouTube on our Hey Listen episode, mm -hmm. um, Low Rule Legend, who we have heard from before, said, great stuff as always. I love the layouts you all use for the video portion of the podcast. Oh, that's might be speaking a bit to, I have a lot of fun recording backgrounds on Breath mm, of the Wild yeah. for these uh, videos. 
the video versions of these. Dolan McNabb over on YouTube said, very awesome of you two to do an entire listener feedback episode. Congrats to Kate for making it into Lost and Yonkers. Miss theater life myself. <laughs> love the video. Love you too. And hope you all nothing but the best. P.S. When you read my comment in when you read my comment in Top 10 Towns, I flipped out and called my girlfriend to let her know. <laughs> Keep up the videos. Heart emoji. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Dolan, call your girlfriend again because we're talking about you. <laughs> Dolan <laughs> thank, McNabb. Thank you for the little personal personal notes too. Yeah, yeah. He said he does a bit of theater, I think. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, it sounds like it. Ooh, I'm kind of, I mean, I'm getting a lot of creative satisfaction doing these podcasts and mm-hmm. doing the six five stuff, but I haven't been in a play now since you and I were in one together. I was going to ask you about that if you had plans to do yep. something like that again anytime soon. I don't know if I have time for theater right now because it does take three or four months of your life. Oh, yeah. But I wasn't planning on talking about this, but um, T.C. DeWitt, who is a host and He's a host of another 6-5 show, a show called The Studio Demands It. Mm-hmm. I'm sure people have heard ads for it. They're probably going to hear an ad for it in this very episode. <laughs> um, he produces a show for us, and he's actually going to be a guest in our next episode. Whoa, this is yeah. all coming around. He and Small I were world. chatting, and he is a writer, a screenwriter, and he um, often works with a team of people that produce short films, and he says he has a role for me that he wants me to do. Nice. So maybe in the next half a year, I'll be able to get a little bit of acting out of my system again. Awesome. You know, the film acting is nice because it only takes – a week or a weekend. It's like just the maybe a little rehearsal with the script, but it's mostly you're on set. Right. Obviously, with theater, you have to memorize sometimes hours worth of dialogue. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then 13 performances over the course of multiple weekends, so. which is truly satisfying. But it is it is an investment. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I, I can now say personally, I have two new friends <laughs> on Facebook: uh, Ryan Kuhn and his wife Mary. Oh my goodness. I forgot her name. She has sent us many, many comments. But uh, Ryan here over on Patreon said, um, you may know. So they, they're they friends with us on actual Facebook. And then we mm-hmm. went ahead and became personal friends. And so, cool. you know, it's not creepy or anything. I just <laughs> look at all their photos and see what their life is like. Everyone find Dave <clears throat> on Facebook. Be his friend. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't actually go on Facebook too much. <clears throat> Pardon me. I mostly go on Facebook to post episode stuff right he said you may know me from twitter and facebook i do ryan how are you good to see you ryan (laughs) and finally remembered to get on here and help donate well thank you very much this is on patreon Uh, i had to say this is one of the best podcasts hope to continue the conversation on here with you and everyone else ryan and i do believe it's mary uh their husband and wife do they're the ones that messaged us where they did the um they kind of binged us on like a 20 hour car ride do you remember that comment that's how we were introduced to them cool they're kind of becoming like a Celeste hey Roberts guys. where we're starting to get to know him a little. Nice. Uh, over on the Hey Listen episode, Jackson Stalling said, there are very few channels that would devote an entire episode to listener feedback. I am thankful for this community y'all have created and enjoy and and overjoyed to hear my comment read. Oh, because we did do a Hey Listen. I guess we'll do, let me jump to some some iTunes and then we'll, we'll get into the episode. Cool. Sounds good. Sliding along, sliding along. You're not singing your song. Okay, back on September 27th, uh, Splatter Note set, titled, gave us a review on iTunes titled Absolutely Obsessed. <laughs> uh, five-star reviews, thank you so much. It obviously helps us uh, climb the charts on iTunes, which is very, very important mm-hmm. to get more listens. Uh, more hey listens. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Splatter Note here said, I have... I have only known about this podcast for a month now, but I have listened to every episode to date, and I look forward to the episodes to come. Thank you, too, for being amazing and giving me something to do in my free time. Perfect podcast. 1,000 out of 10. Woo! Oh, thank well, you, Splatter. No. You're welcome for me being amazing. <laughs> for you being amazing. Back on October 3rd, uh, Miobe Music 71587 said, I'm a big Legend of Zelda fan, of course, but one of the great things about the show is the chemistry between the hosts, Kate and David. Like, I'm not sure if a show with two Davids or just two Kates would work every time. Fair. But they have struck a perfect yin and yang. To, oh, this is amazing. Topics are always interesting, and even the review episode are a treat because I always learn something I didn't know. Can absolutely sense the amount of work and research that go into the episodes and appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Wow. Mio Music 71587. Thank you so much. That's that was awesome. A, that was great. Wait. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, we'll stop there. That was great. I accidentally did a screen grab of that review twice. In oh. the, uh, <laughs> because it was just whew. so good. Whew. That is, that's cool. It's cool that people think that like we're friends. <laughs> 
We're really, we are good actors. We're I mean, we were talking about acting. We're just that good. Mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. just that convincing. It's true. It's true. No, Kate, I, uh, joking aside, I adore doing this podcast with you. I, I love, you know, when we have opportunities to have guests on and I meet with people and I run around and stuff or whatever. That's cool, but. It's just not the same when I, I'm not there. I personally <laughs> enjoy the vibe. I'm just finding my notes here real quick. If there were two Kates doing the podcast, it would just be singing songs all the time. <laughs> what? Probably. Not meaning to, but just all the time singing songs to myself. That's not weird. We should move on. <laughs> I am looking for my show notes. Do you know what I think I did? I think I didn't share them from 6.5 to my personal. Full disclosure, we're going to cut the episode right now. We're going to come back cool. in a minute. I just have to share it over to my iPad. We're going to take a little break. See, that's what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, it would be just 2K singing. Yeah. Okay, we'll see you in zero seconds because this will be edited out. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, we are back. It's been no time at all. <laughs> the magic of editing. Yep, indeed. Uh, our, our magical sword people stayed with us on the camera here. They saw Thanks, buddies. all the amazing nothingness that happened <laughs> while I loaded these notes. However, Kate, I feel a bit like you today. Usually when we do these episodes, it's one thing, uh, speaking to the yin and yang of our chemistry on this show, I always get a kick out of the fact that for, a, for most episodes, you will have pages of notes, which mm-hmm. I f- completely appreciate. And if I'm lucky, I'll have like five words scratched on a napkin. Those are my <laughs> notes for these episodes. And uh, I feel a bit like you today. I have, I have pages of notes. Yeah. Tell me a story, Dave. All right. Zelda 64. Long, long ago. Mm-hmm. Also won Game of the Year, by the way, as did Breath of the Wild. Ooh. They really didn't have Game of the Year stuff back when the original one came out. But one of the things that was really exciting in my research for Zelda 64, which I will continue to call it, uh, was the parallels that it had to the Hyrule fantasy mm-hmm. and the development. And then there's also a little bit of parallels to Breath of the Wild. I do feel that those three games, and maybe I'll speak to this more at the very end of this episode, mm-hmm. those three games, in my opinion, are the three that really went to the next step and really redefined Zelda. Sure. Wind Waker, Skyward, Twilight were off of the mold that Ocarina built. Right, kind of continuations of the same formula. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Breath of the Wild clearly created a new one. Mm -hmm. And so the the development stories, I mean, it would be awesome to do a Breath of the Wild one maybe next season or something. Um, I don't know if it had a tentative title. There was a Wii U demo But I don't know what its name was, but I don't want to get too far off. Zelda Switch, because they had to name it after the system. Or Zelda Zelda Wii U, U, but also Switch. Yeah, right. Yeah, there was a Wii U demo, but I'll, anyway. So, Kate. Yes. The story of the making of Ocarina of Time starts with Tom Cruise. Oh. I'm kind of joking. It starts with a Tom Cruise movie, Days of Thunder. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. You mentioned this to me. I'm kind of joking. You were, you were, you were, Dave was sending me uh, texts about how he was excited to record this episode. And he was like, here's a hint. It starts with this. And I was like, well, I'm not going to look into this further because I want this to all be fresh information. So please elaborate. Uh, in uh, like 1991, early 92, a company named Argonaut Studios created a game for the Days of Thunder film for the Game Boy. Mm -hmm. It was the Days of Thunder Game Boy game. This game is like famous for video game collectors. It was one of the first games to truly do vectors. Now, there were some vectors that happened like back on the Atari. There was some simple stuff like Battle Tank. But Argonaut Studios created an engine, a 3D engine that could map out drawing lines in 3D space. Oh, Are you Googling it right now? I am. <clears throat> Days of Thunder for the Game Boy was not a great game. It played at you know almost six frames a second, ten frames if you were lucky. I have played it. It's it's famous. <laughs> um, the Days of Thunder video game immediately uh, caught the attention of Nintendo and also another game called X, and that was kind of like a flying game slash mm. tank game. Mm-hmm. Also for the Game Boy. Okay. Super weird because the Game Boy did not normally render vectors. The Game Boy is a tile-based engine where it lays down <coughs> tiles. It doesn't. It can't really think in 3D. Right. This led to Argonaut Studios being hired to make Star Fox. Mm, gotcha. And so maybe you're starting to put together some of the Polygon references here. Mm-hmm. In 1991, Link to the Past came out, became, got a Game of the Year. Mm-hmm. 
And what did they really have game of the year last that at that point? I shouldn't, I don't know. Let's, I don't know. But Dylan Cuthbert of Argonaut Studios in 1992 created X. Um, Miyamoto and company got mm-hmm. very excited about a 3D engine. And up to this point, only four Zelda games existed. The original Legend of Zelda, Zelda 2, we'll call it, The Adventure mm-hmm. of Link, um, A Link to the Past. Mm-hmm. And then there was, of course, this tinkering around with Link's Awakening, which famously was like a side project and then became a real game. Mm-hmm. But really, it was A Link to the Past was the last time like the team had worked on a full Zelda game. Mm-hmm. Miyamoto. Now, we've talked about how Ocarina of Time actually has a lot of Zelda 2 connections. Mm-hmm. And Miyamoto was really excited about creating a three-dimensional sword fighting game and having that be a Zelda game. Mm-hmm. So much so that it was the same kind of... Um... So in a link in the adventure of Link, Zelda 2, I think I've told you about this, the, the way... There's like a heavy emphasis on sword play. So the Link sprite in Zelda 2 is two sprites tall. He has a shield that he can hold high or low. He can attack high or low. Okay. And all the enemies, when they attack Link, can attack high or low. So there's a lot of like, if you attack high and they block, it goes tink, and you don't you don't get it. You can't just mash away in Zelda 2. Right. Much to the chagrin of people who were used to just button mashing when they played Zelda games. Sure, yeah. Swipe, 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 swipe. Yeah, even for me, it's tricky. When you go into a battle, you can't just like <clears throat> smash on A in Zelda 2. You have to go in and be like, okay, I'm going to back up. I'm going to go forward. Okay, go for a low hit. Go for a high. It's almost like a punching game. You know what I mean? Or mm-hmm. a boxing game. I mean, a punching game. A, the, where you punch. Yep. Yes. It's punching that punching game. So <laughs> they wanted to create a 3D Zelda game back even in 1992. This is even like around the time that Star Fox was getting built. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was kind of shelved pretty quickly. Because um, in 1993, Nintendo announced their partnership with Silicon Graphics, which was a, uh, a company in California that was founded in 1981. And they created um, a thing called Project Reality. In fact, I actually have a kind of not a weird connection to Project Reality. There's no connection at all. But I remember a day when my dad, who was an electrical engineer at Snap-on Tools at the time, mm-hmm. back in the early 90s, he brought a like an engineer's magazine home. And he said, hey, Dave, look at this. And I was like, what? And he said, it looks like, like this isn't an engineer, it wasn't a video game magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, this engineer magazine that was getting pushed around the office had an article about Nintendo partnering with this company, Silicon Graphics, and these special chips that they were going to use. Mm-hmm. Um, adjacent to similar chips that rendered like Donkey Kong Country and stuff like that. But uh, this was going to be the Nintendo 64, but it was called Project Reality. And of course, in America, it was titled the Ultra 64 once it became realized as a system. So there was a tech demo that came out um, in 1995. Now we're going forward. It's already been 92, 93, 94, 95. We're already four years after Link's Awakening. Pardon me, A Link to the Past. Mm -hmm. So Link to the Past, I mean, there was Link's Awakening in there, but like fans were waiting and waiting and waiting for the Zelda game. It was taking a long time. Ultimately, it was seven years between the two. Um, and so I looked at it and I was, I thought this was amazing. So back in, in the 1995, uh, Zelda was demoed on the ultra, ultra 64 with running its Silicon graphics chip. Mm -hmm. And that chip ultimately was still in the Nintendo 64. And, um, at the time two games were announced to be like the flagship games for this ultra 64. We know it as super Mario 64 and Zelda 64. (laughs) Now, Zelda 64 was only a demo being played, but it was in-engine, they were saying, and it was showing off all of these really fancy, like, metal reflection things. It was Link fighting, essentially, a knight in armor, Mm -hmm. and that knight in armor had a ton of, like, fake reflections going, and it was all very impressive and cool. Mm -hmm. Now, before this episode, I showed you what Link's model looked like in that demo. How do you feel about that model? Uh, Was it, didn't, it looked like a cowboy, right? (laughs) Okay. Kind of to me from what I saw briefly, but yeah, not like Link. Um, yeah, right. yeah, it was a completely different model. It was at the time there was a there was a designer that was working, if I remember correctly. Now I didn't put this in my notes. One of the designers at Nintendo that was more was more connected to when they were considering making a 2D sword fighting game helped with this demo. But after the demo, he left the project, and a few, and basically a trifecta of three designers came on. Um, one was, well, Miyamoto was there as part of it, but one, let me get their names, let me get their names. Oh my gosh, please have me put their names down. Okay, yep, here we go. Forgive me with my for my pronunciation. 
Well, one was IG Enuma, mm -hmm. the now famous IG Enuma. One was Yos Yos Yoshioka Kazumi. Now mm -hmm. I've have, I have heard people refer to Kazumi. Mm -hmm. um, Kazumi actually did work on Link's Awakening, and he worked on Link to the Past, and he became kind of the head developer for Ocarina of Time. Okay, but after Ocarina, it was fascinating. I'm going to jump forward just for a second. Um, let's let's say that Kazumi, Anuma, and Miyamoto were were spearheading this project. There were some other designers that were working too. There was a level designer and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. these three were kind of tasked with what to make of Ocarina of Time. Mm -hmm. We now know that IG Enuma kind of took the handle. Well, he he uh, he he designed the infamous water dungeon in Ocarina mm -hmm. of Time, and he went on to be the lead designer for Majora's Mask. Mm -hmm. Yep. And now he's famous for being basically the the guy who's the head of Zelda projects. Mm -hmm. IG Enuma, um, Kazumi y Yoshi Yoshi Yoshioka Yoshioka. Kazumi, Kazumi is much more easier to pronounce. I, I apologize for for butchering that first name, but he actually went on to do the Mario Galaxy games. Oh yeah! And to this day, Kazumi is the main developer for like Mario 3D World, and and he did Mario Odyssey. So now imagine these two gentlemen, uh, Anuma and Kazumi, working with Miyamoto in Ocarina of Time, and they have just grown to be powerhouses now. And Kazumi went towards the Mario stuff, and Anuma went towards the Zelda stuff, which is kind of neat, just as a flash forward real cool, quick. Cool, cool. Miyamoto still being on as like a lead, you know, he kind of, he's still like a lead. He's almost like a, like in theater, like an artistic director who comes in and makes sure that the show's on brand and makes sure that the, the like the level of quality of lighting is correct and stuff, you know, like in theater. Mm -hmm, anyway, mm -hmm. so, um, so let's rewind back to 1995. You okay? Yeah, something in my house is making noise and it's haunted. Anyway, go on. Oh, really? Well, I'm <laughs> kind of moving the chair here a little. Is it that? My um, house is settling and it's creeping me out. It's getting cold out. Mm -hmm. We got down into the 20s up in Chicago the other day. Yeah, it's going to snow tomorrow night and I'm not excited about it. But anyway. <laughs> I had one beautiful snow moment where I, I got off work a few nights ago and it was the light fluffy stuff. Oh, and yeah. And I was like, I'll take it. Aww. I'll take it. It was, it was melted by the next day, but. That's the best. So Yeah, because then it's beautiful and then you don't have to deal and with it. Gone. You don't have to shovel it. All right, so let me let me dial in here a little bit. So that's just kind of neat. So imagine these three people as the team. Um, so what happened was, so this this tech demo at Space World was just a demo. It didn't even have a HUD or a game. It was almost a cutscene, mm -hmm. you know. And everybody got very excited about it. By the way, side note, Nintendo is now f famous for doing these Zelda tech demos that never become a game. <laughs> they did it for Zelda sixty four. They definitely did it for. Wait, let me look. Let me look. Let me look. I have them down here. GameCube. Uh, GameCube had a after Nintendo 64. GameCube had a photorealistic, photorealistic in quotes, mm -hmm. Link and Ganondorf fight that was like really super smooth. And then later released Wind Waker. You might have seen that demo just in the zeitgeist, mm -hmm. but if you don't recall, that's okay. And then for Breath of the Wild, there was also like a pseudo Twilight Princess style uh, demo where Link was fighting a massive spider. Maybe you've seen that one that was mm. demoed. And then later it became Breath of the Wild, completely different art style. Mm -hmm. So Nintendo does this to kind of prop up their systems. They'll do a demo of a Zelda game, but it's not gameplay. Just gets purposeful, misleading. Maybe a little bit. It gets people very excited. Yeah. So, okay, so let's go to 1995. Space World has released. People know that Zelda 64 might be a thing that exists. Um, Mario was Mario 64 was playable at that uh, that expo okay space world was a very very popular expo in japan for a long time i think it still exists but i really don't know it was kind of before the e3 stuff mm -hmm. bubbled up here in america right and um i did see pictures of zelda 64 in magazines oh and also like this silicon graphics it was just it was at that time screen grabs didn't even exist it would be reporters would take pictures of screens <laughs> at these expos and then publish them in magazines Aww. so these like if you go online today it's just these blurry blurry images because it's really just photos of screens <laughs> anyway so um another thing that was kind of revealed in 1995 along you know at this space world event was that super mario 64 was going to be for the nintendo 64 but zelda 64 was announced to be to use the Nintendo 64 disk drive. Sound familiar? Oh yeah. The, this is crazy. The disk drive. Yes. This is a complete parallel to 
the Hyrule Fantasy, the original The Legend of Zelda. Oh, yeah. Being pos- positioned as the disk drive game for the original Nintendo Entertainment System. That's right. I remember that. Now, the, the Nintendo 64 DD, I mean, this was just, they're just taking, they're just doing the exact same cues here. They, <laughs> it was going to be, it had a little bit more memory. It was going to have rewritable data, all mm-hmm. that stuff. And Zelda 64 was going to be for the Nintendo 64 disk drive. Um, uh,. I guess I'm jumping forward a little bit here, but it ended up being, they ended up when the 64 disk drive didn't do particularly well in Japan, they didn't even want to release it in America. And very quickly they released the uh, Nintendo 64 on a cartridge. And at the time it was like a 200, it was a 32 megabyte, megabit, megabyte, 32 megabyte cartridge, which was the biggest, largest cartridge that Nintendo could make at the time. Mm -hmm. I remember that Zelda cartridge being a little heavier than other games. You might recall. Yeah, I thought that too. It had chips. It had more chips in it. Literally, it had more hard drive space on it, to be honest. Huh. Um, I have noticed that. Yeah, it was a solid, thick cartridge. (laughs) Um, And again, just as a side note, in Japan, they still did release that what we know of as the Master Quest version of Ocarina of Time, they did release that as a 64DD like add-on thing, mm-hmm. but it was transitioned over to being a cartridge. <coughs> it was the largest cartridge Nintendo could make. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So the team's working on the game for a year. Let's fast forward to 1996. And uh, Kazumi is there. Anuma's there. And they are working on... And as they build these models... Oh, by the way, Kazumi is the guy who built the adult link model for Ocarina of Time. Mm, okay. They built it kind of you know quickly. There was many many there's many screenshots of areas and levels that don't exist in Ocarina now. I'm sure they were just kind of quick building stuff and trying mm-hmm. things out. There's an entire town that got built that Aww. doesn't exist anymore. I know. Sad. I wonder if they couldn't fit it all or if they decided they couldn't populate it enough and so cuz actual castle towns kind of honestly it's pretty small. Mm-hmm. What the final thing was. Yeah. So uh, Miyamoto gets an idea in 96. They're getting, he's getting pretty. So, oh, by the way, Zelda 64 was being built on the Super Mario 64 engine. Super Mario 64 was working. Mm-hmm. It was a success. It might have even come out by 96. Uh, yep, June 23rd, 96. Oh, you have dates up? I'm looking at a list of the best selling uh, Nintendo 64 video game. And so Super Mario 64 came out when? June 23rd, 1996. Amazing. Because Zelda did come out a couple years later. Yep. Um, so so the Super Mario 64 engine is being used to build Zelda. There are screenshots of Link using the the Super Mario 64 look around system where the camera goes in way behind his head and he looks around like that. Now you might remember that in Ocarina of Time, they go, it goes into a full on first person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now that's kind of interesting because early in development for Super Mario 64, (laughs) even though they were using the Super Mario 64 engine, Miyamoto had an idea to maybe have Ocarina of Time or The Legend of Zelda be a first-person game, full first-person. His idea was, oh, we finally have an opportunity to make something really, really immersive. We should try it. Mm. You know, and I guess that's cool. I guess that's kind of almost what Skyrim is a bit these days when people play in first-person. Mm-hmm. Maybe mm-hmm. that's what Miyamoto was envisioning. But Kazumi hated this idea so much so he didn't even want to test it some posit that it's because he made the model of link and wanted to show link off i totally get it (laughs) um but they did finally implement a little bit of first person and it um was actually kind of unsuccessful they they uh found that it was visually kind of boring to be honest yeah i don't think i would like it as much if you couldn't see link couldn't see link do his cool stuff yeah right I mean, he's such an iconic character that, yeah, if he wasn't there. Well, originally they were thinking, ironically, this is hysterical. The original plan was that you would play. Well, there was a moment where the plan was. I shouldn't say the original plan. There was a moment where the plan was to have the game be a first person game. And then when you switch to arrows or slingshots or combat, it would swing out and be a third person game. Oh, yeah. And then like go back back into his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Um, you Oh, I think I've mentioned, you had like that? mentioned that before, yeah. I think it's really funny because the final product is we're playing in third person, and when we do arrows, we go into a first person. Right. <laughs> so there was a solid year or two where oh, even the arrow stuff was still done as a third person kind of thing. Mm-hmm. There's many screenshots of Link just aiming around. And you can kind of still do arrows in third person uh, with the lock on Z targeting thing, mm-hmm. but Z targeting yep. wasn't invented yet. They were still, imagine like. Link running around in Mario land a little bit. They didn't really have a... Tar- that targeting mechanic didn't exist. The auto jumping didn't exist. In fact, there was a button for jump. <gasps> there was a jump button. <gasps> which we wouldn't ever <laughs> see again for real until really Breath of the Wild. How things would have changed. Mm-hmm. 
So um, let's see here. Let me consult my notes a little bit. Uh, they decided to go third person. So let's. We're still in 1996, but the uh, again, Space World 96 in November, November 24th, a trade show in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a demo of the game, of portions of the game, and I think there was like there was, there was something called the the four. It wasn't the Forest Temple. They called it just the wood the the woods the dungeon of the woods or something. You know, they really didn't have titles yet. Mm-hmm. Many many posit that that became the Deku. My collar keeps popping up here. It's a thick collar on this sweater. I don't know. Maybe if it pops up, I'll just let it be. But um, So concerned with fashion. Yeah, right? On a podcast. <laughs> it's annoying me. It kind of like, I can feel it. Anyway, um, so in this demo, there was a couple different areas to play. There was this large town, which just had a couple people in it. Um, so Link, it was the, the A button was set to jump. Mm-hmm. Um, the, I don't, it was the A button. Oh, yeah. Only the A button existed. It was A and B. They, none of the C button things were happening yet. Mm-hmm. And you were hot swapping your B button. So it was a bit like we're playing A Link to the Past right now. Oh, Lord. So A Link to the Past, the B button is sword, I believe. And then Y is your item. And that's the only, one frustration I get with A Link to the Past right now, personally, is that I think I got a little bit spoiled with all the C buttons. And in, in, I like mapping like three items. Mm-hmm. Even in A Link to the Past, even in Link's Awakening, if you, you only get two, but you can swap out both. Right. In A Link to the Past, you can only swap one. So that does get a little Tedious. tricky. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, sometimes there's a lot of hot swapping where I'm like, okay, I want to use the lantern. I want to use the bombs. And hot kinda, swapping. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's funny when you put it that way. <laughs> hot swapping. So, uh, so there was a manual jump in 1996. They at least started to have um, Navi as an indicator, as an icon to go show things. Mm-hmm. And what else? What else? There was no young Link or anything yet. It was just an adult Link running around. It was still a solid Mario 64 engine. And um, that was it. A little bit later, Kazumi uh, came up with the idea for Z-targeting. We're going back. We're coming out of the show and we're going back into development. Mm-hmm. So imagine Kazumi, Anuma, and Miyamoto all working together. The team was growing. Now there are more artists and things like that. We're in like late '96. Okay. I want to repeat: the first, <laughs> the original idea of a 3D fighting Link was 1992. Yep. <laughs> now, of course, you know, a Link to the Past came out in '93-ish, I believe. Um, I don't know if I have that in my notes here. Looking real quick, look going up. I'm going up to the top. Star Fox was 93. Link to the past. Can you check it out real quick? 91. Whoa, 91. Wow. So yeah, we're yep. almost seven yep. years away. We're you know six. Wait, 91. We were. How's my math? About five years away. <laughs> I went the wrong way with the with the one. So it's been five years since a since a proper Nintendo or Zelda game. Even though I love Link's Awakening. Right. At this point, um, they were trying to figure out combat, and they're trying to do a 3D combat, and. Basically, if you think about the combat in The Adventure of Link, Zelda 2, it's two-dimensional combat, duh, of course, obviously. Mm-hmm. Actually, actually, no, not obviously, because usually combat in a Zelda game is 2D, but it's top-down. Right. So, you can... so in Link, in Link, The Adventure of Link, it's the only time that combat is 2D, but sideways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So striking high and striking low, that's the only game where that can actually happen. Mm-hmm. Well, now we're in a 3D environment, and they realized, well, if we... I am. I will deduce, based on the things that I've read, this is not a direct quote or anything, the Z-targeting element came to be because essentially you take a 3D game and you turn it into a 2D side game. It's still in 3D space, but when you Z-target something, all your controls, you're playing, really you're taking a flat line between you and the thing you're Z-targeting to, and that's now like the 2D game. Right. Right? Even though there's 3D stuff happening around you. And um, so also Anuma and Kazumi often would creatively kind of butt heads during this whole process throughout the years. Hmm. And Miyamoto was operating kind of as a, as the overlord a little bit. (laughs) Um, Because, well, Miyamoto had his roots, but he was, he was allowing these two individuals that really, because, so Anuma was kind of new and Kazumi had come from A Link to the Past. So Anuma was the new guy. Gotcha. Um, And Kazumi was the one that came up with Z-targeting, actually. This mechanic, it's brilliant. And it's like famous to Zelda now, even though he mm-hmm. ended up going towards something that doesn't use Z-targeting, the Mario games. Right. And Anuma admitted in interviews, um, he admitted that, this is not a direct quote, that if they had not been able to to come up with Z-targeting, 
the game probably wouldn't have been a, a very good game. <laughs> like it, they probably would have never cracked the code that that was the moment where Zelda became Zelda was Z-targeting. Interesting. Now, I think that's interesting because Z-targeting changed the gaming universe. Right. Maybe it was a game changer. Right. For 3D games and all games, so many games use Z-targeting now, whether they mm-hmm. call it that or not, right. whether it automatically targets to someone or not. It was, it was, Z-targeting is as important as the Mario jump, in my opinion, Ooh. when it comes to game development. Bold you know? statement, Dave. Yeah. And even though Anuma is kind of the, the Zelda guy these days, we got to give it to Kazumi uh, for coming up with that. Nice. Oh, also, uh, at that, at, in 1996, there were screenshots of a quote unquote sky temple, by the way. Ooh. There were things that were, that had a sky backdrop, and uh, there were, areas where clearly had no floor and it was like sky below uh-huh. so i don't know which I don't know. you know obviously came into play later in on twilight yep indeed indeed mm-hmm. i wonder if anuma kind of hung on to the ideas and they wanted to return to it it's a good idea i like those levels oh i just realized something so i have said before that i i appreciate ig anuma i have learned since i did a bit of research on him i've learned that he did not start as a game designer he started as an artist and like a painter and stuff like that mm-hmm. And he came into game design not knowing much about games. And I think that that gives him a unique perspective on Yeah, games. it's like a fresh set of eyes. Yeah, and in some ways, we have seen his effects on Zelda games since Ocarina, since Water Temple. Water Temple, love it or hate it, became <laughs> the new direction of Zelda. Mm-hmm. Because I tell you what, Majora's Mask, all four of those dungeons were designed by Anuma and his team. And they are famous for being like the water dungeon in that they are somewhat brilliant. They're somewhat, okay. All four dungeons in Majora's Mask force you to understand the whole dungeon and force you to use the whole dungeon as a puzzle. Okay. And I can't wait for us to play that game yeah, because they're really cool. I have not played any of those dungeons. So yeah. <laughs> I'm like, there's, what are they like? I'll give you a hint. There's one dungeon where there's a mechanic where you literally continue to flip the dungeon 180 degrees and you have to solve mm, puzzles that way. I did hear about that one. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's other cool. things like that. The, I mean, there is a water dungeon in Majora's Mask. It also has similar complications, but I digress. So um, Sky Temple. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I was going to say, like, the Sky Temple. I wonder if when Twilight Princess happened, it was Anuma's way to kind of return to some of those <laughs> concepts. I'm thinking maybe we take a break here because now we're going to start going into the phase where the team has explored a lot of ideas and they start reeling things in. I'm going to tell you a tale after this break about... <laughs> Uh, the forest medallions being items that you could use Ooh. originally. I'm going to talk to you about how they decided not to use a jump button. I'm going to talk to you about um, having Link be aware of his surroundings, the the context sensitive stuff. All of this was game changers. And I'm going to tell you about the creation of Young Link. Awesome. Sounds good. I love it so far. Scenes. Yeah. All right, cool. cool. I can't wait. We t- we'll take a real break. And uh, audience, we'll see you in, in 30 seconds after I'm sure a studio demands it, Ad. And uh, we'll be back. Okay. Bye. Hey, this is TC. And this is Jim from the Studio Demands It podcast. Where every episode, we take a demand from a hypothetical studio. Which could be you. And challenge ourselves to conceptualize, pitch, and craft a film based on the stipulations. Or the demands. We are given. We talk about movies all the time. Particularly, we complain about the choices made in the films we've seen. We're nerds like that. And, of course, like any good nerd does, we automatically assume that we could do better. Even with the demands and restrictions that clearly must have been put on by a production. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com and listen to our previous library of episodes. Our library of previous episodes. Our precious library, Jim. (laughs) Our library of precious episodes. (laughs) You're a pirate (laughs) Smeagol. Okay. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com to listen to our library of episodes. And submit your demand for a future episode, too. So go do that. Okay, bye. Okay, end of ad. Hey everybody, David here. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. I just wanted to talk to you about some of the updates we have on our Patreon page. Now, as some of you know, we do have our three tiers, the sword tier, the white sword tier, and the magical sword tier. And we've been getting some really tremendous support over on Patreon. It's it's tr- truly amazing. And I want to tell you a little bit about some of our new rewards. So for starters, we've decided to add the wallpaper reward to our sword tier. This means that anyone who is a supporter on Patreon will get a special thank you 
you on our website, and they'll also receive the ability to download wallpapers once a month from our Patreon page. Now, I make these wallpapers myself, and it's a lot of fun. They come in a variation of screen sizes. I also make a phone version and an iPad version. I even make an Apple Watch version, which is kind of fun. Next, we have our White Sword tier, and that's staying pretty much the same. What the White Sword level will give you is early access to each of our episodes. Typically, it's about a week before. Um, also, advertisement-free versions of those episodes, and I record a little Patreon-specific intro before each one, just a touch of behind the scenes before we get into the episode. Also, of course, on the White Sword tier, we have our bonus content, which we release just little mini episodes every, oh, I don't know, every three or four normal episodes, we put a little mini episode in there. That will also be available on the private RSS link that you'll receive by becoming a White Sword member. And lastly, this is the big one. Our Magical Sword tier, Kate and I have decided to bring a camera with us into the studio, you could say, every single episode going forward after episode 17 of season two. So we just kind of set this camera up and we say a little quick intro to our Magical Sword patrons and we let them be there with us, so to speak, while we record the episode. I'm really excited about this because I've been wanting to give our Magical Sword supporters something really special, and I think this is a great way to do it. Okay, so that's it. You can go to patreon.com slash another Zelda podcast. You can also find links on our website to our Patreon page. We're so grateful for the support we've received already, and um, if you are interested in any of these rewards at all, please go check us out. Okay, we are back from the break. Kate, I'm enjoying this. Same. It's like being told a little a little story about a game that I love so much. It is. It's a cool story, and there's so much more. I feel like I could do a complete second episode. I have to move my mic so I can see my screen. There we go. Um, I mean, there are interviews that I found where... Actually, there's a, a lot of interviews. Do you remember the... Um, the... Uh, Awada Asks series that happened when when Awada was the president of Nintendo. No. Rest in peace. No. Uh, he would do this these things where he would interview people and they would release it almost as blogs on their Nintendo website. Hmm. When the when Grezzo was doing the Ocarina of Time 3D remake, Grezzo of the Link's Awakening remake fame. Ah. Um, when they were their first gig with Nintendo was to do the remastered 3D one for for uh, DS 3DS. Gotcha. Okay. During that time, though, Awada took that opportunity to interview a lot of the original team that worked on Ocarina. And there's a ton of interviews out there of the team just talking about the development and stuff. Oh, I had a good time reading cool. all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. You'd mentioned you really, really like doing the research for this episode. My The only thing that's stressful is I actually want to talk for five hours. So I'm trying to keep this moving. <laughs> So, okay, so let's go to 1997. This is, in my opinion, this is kind of like the final phases here. This is 97 to a, a, an eventual 98 release. Mm -hmm. This is when we see, in my opinion, we see a lot of the stuff start coming together. There's still a little bit of experimentation, but like the game exists. Mm -hmm. um, but originally there wasn't, at this phase of development, there wasn't an ocarina. <laughs> I know. Uh, that's kind of important. The game was just called Of Time. <laughs> yeah. No. Zelda uh -huh. 64 oh. of time. Yep. Zelda 64 of time. No, no, no. I'm sure it was probably still called Zelda 64. They, a lot of times they have the working titles and they call it something by the end. Except for all the other 64 games. Breath of, oh, I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. When I say they, I mean like the Zelda games. Like Breath of the Wild, oh, the yeah, actual yeah, yeah. title for Breath of the Wild came very, very late. Yep. Maybe I've said this before, but famously, I've said famously a lot in this episode, but um, they did struggled coming up with the title for Breath of the Wild because usually a Zelda game is the t subtitle is about an object or an item mm -hmm. or like a thing or a person. Mm -hmm. um, and they ended up saying Breath of the Wild was the appropriate title because the thing in Breath of the Wild is the wild. Is the wild. Mm -hmm. More so than even the divine beasts or anything else. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree too. Okay, so uh, 1997, There's, you know, it's interesting because you can kind of clock the development of this game by its space world appearance, appearances mm. over the years. <laughs> so here we are, 97, there's another space world appearance. So every year there's a little bit more development and something that Nintendo's proving to the market. Pro people, you know. sorry, people are like, where's the game already? A little bit, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Oh, there's this, there's this beautiful little an anecdote that I found online about how Miyamoto was at a gas station um, in a different town and the like. The store clerk was like, Miyamoto, why are you here? And Miyamoto was like, what? He said, you're supposed to be in X, Y, or Z working on the game. <laughs> 
Get like, out of here. Everyone in Japan knew there was new and was waiting for this game to happen. It was so famous that even just Miyamoto trying to get gas, he was being talked to about it. <laughs> Why are you? You're in the wrong city. You're supposed to be back making the Zelda game. <laughs> I need to play it. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Um, okay, so uh, at this, so some of the things that were observed at this Space World build, we could say, mm-hmm. was that, um, oh, actually, no, I have a, a quote from Kotaku here. Kotaku, who in our uh, Sunday episode of Midwest Gaming Classic, I was able to interview one of the editors of Kotaku Now. Cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, Chris Kohler is his name. It was awesome to meet him. It was, I was a little starstruck. It was super <laughs> cool. Uh, but Kotaku back then uh, quoted Miyamoto as saying, um, as we were developing Mario 64, we were experimenting with what was possible within that space. Kind of like, should it be first person? Uh, can Should the camera go behind Link's head? Is it? Is, do you do combat in 3D? Because they had to... <clears throat> You build these rules of space, and then you have to build a camera that works in those rules. Anyway, anyway, um, that almost became a 30-minute thing, so I'm going to reel it in. <laughs> Possible within that space, uh, we tried to apply what we had learned for the next big franchise. And for us, that was Zelda, is mm-hmm. what he said, mm-hmm. is what he said at this event. Um, so some of the things there was a – one of the new things that was observed is now the HUD had a A button that wasn't jump. Mm-hmm. And it would flip around and change to be different things. So it was context sensitive. Oh, by the way, um, back in, is it here or is it later? No. Okay. So there was jump. The uh, the A button's default was jump, but mm-hmm. it would flip to other things when you'd walk up to a ladder or walk up to a whatever. Mm-hmm. I think in the, in the current build, it like just pulls out his sword or something, isn't it? What does A do when you're doing nothing? Oh, it's put away. Yeah. Yep. It's just put whatever you have away. Mm-hmm. Funny. <laughs> the A button, the most action-based button, if you're doing nothing in Zelda, has you not do a thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, I've got a thing to do something with. Oh, nah. don't use it? No. It's the don't use button. I just realized. <laughs> <laughs> but Slash course, open a door. Yeah. I mean, it does so many things. Right. The context, that was, I remember reading an article. I'm just going off on a side note here. Yeah, I don't know what it was, Nintendo Power EGM or what, about an entire article about the concept of a button that would change what it needs to do. Hmm. And that was also developed for Zelda 64. Oh, man. And that is used in everything ever now. Yeah. yeah. The, I mean, it's staggering. The staples that were set, knowingly or unknowingly, mm-hmm. for the rest of the game industry. So one thing that was fun, um, there uh, were medallions. The, we know like the forest, all the, the, the six medallions that you collect, mm-hmm. they were seem to be mapped to C buttons. And the idea was that they would actually be a little, I would imagine that what we know of as the three spells from the yeah, goddesses. That's kind of where I thought you were going with that. Probably originally realized as like you throw the fire medallion down and then something happens. You throw mm-hmm. uh, the forest dungeon was not called the forest medallion. It was called the wind medallion mm. and it would do gusts of whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's also why if you pay close attention to the forest medallion, I think you spoke to this in one of our Ocarina episodes for some reason, it's kind of more like a fan or a yeah. piece of, wi- you know, it's like a wind gust yeah. uh, as the medallion. And it's like, why, why is it windy? You shouldn't be a leaf or something. Right. They just kept it as this wind medallion. Huh. Um, and uh, so the idea is you would maybe still get the medallions from the dungeons, but then you would use them. And that was kind of like the item you would get. And that's how you'd get like an upgrade. You get an item halfway through the dungeon and then you get these magical powers. Cool. The magical powers would dynamically change the way you inter- interacted. You could burn things. You could do whatever. Burn Ooh. things. Adjacent to the powers you get in Breath of the Wild, how you kind of get like, here's a power. You can use it on things. Right. Not just like this is just the grappling hook or something. Yep. I just realized now. You can use it on all the things. Yeah. And also Miyamoto had said in other interviews that I found um, that he was working on a system where you could even combine the medallions together Ooh. and create. So maybe if it was the wind and I'm just guessing uh, the fire, maybe you could make something that would blow fire, you know? Interesting. I know. Now, they they toyed around with the idea. It never entered actual development, the mixing. But what they did do, which we later saw in Ocarina, is they did create a mechanic where you could take the medallions and attach them to your arrows. Mm, okay, yep. Fire arrows. Yep. Ice arrows. Light uh, arrows. Wind arrows. <laughs> mm. Light, you know, the whole thing. Right. Now, later, they just made those be like upgrades. Mm-hmm. Remember, you just get the ice arrows, you just get the fire arrows. Yep. But originally, you would attach medallions to them, which is cool because I'm sure they were coming up with that idea because in Link's Awakening, you can like make a bomb arrow by attaching the two buttons together and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so one of the other things that's really interesting about this build, so there's medallions all over the place. There's, there is not an ocarina. Uh, let me consult my notes. I want to make sure that I'm at the right time. Yeah, um, Epona now exists. She did not yeah. in previous builds. And actually, this is an awesome little tidbit. In all the previous builds, what we know of as Hyrule Field did not exist. So in the previous builds, they just had big chunks of sections that would load, 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 load. Mm-hmm. You'd go into the next thing and it would load as much as it could. you go to the next thing, it would load as much as it could. Mm-hmm. Once they developed Epona, again, this is with Adult Link, still no Young Link. Mm-hmm. They developed Epona solely because Miyamoto said he wanted to do like a Wild Western kind of feel where he wanted horse riding, horseback riding, mm-hmm. which is neat because that further informs what happens in Twilight Princess and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Also, I'll note that I.G. Anuma said that a large inspiration for the Breath of the Wild 2 sequel is Red Dead Redemption. Ooh. Whereas he said a large inspiration for Breath of the Wild was like the Skyrims. Yeah. I shouldn't say inspiration. I'm, I'm misquoting him. He said, he he joked, I'll say, that when they were building Breath of the Wild 2, his team was playing a lot of Skyrim and like finding maybe some inspiration there. Gotcha. He said that the, the game that they were playing a lot of for Breath of the Wild 2 is Red Dead Redemption. I wonder if your husband oh. might further enjoy Breath of the Wild 2. I would guess so because... I know he loves Red Dead Redemption. Goodness, he does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like I would. I don't have that system. I don't have a PlayStation or whatever. Mm-hmm. I do feel that Red Dead Redemption 2 and Breath of the Wild are tremendously similar in ways as far as them being open world and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're just satisfying slightly different cravings. But anyways, okay, uh, let's get back onto this. So there was a Pona. And it was realized, cool, we have a horse that we can ride around, but you could never really imagine riding a Pona through Kakariko Village. You could really just walk around. Right. And they wanted to really get out there. They realized, oh, you have to, we have to build a big space. Right. So you can run free and yes. gallop and yeah. trot. So <laughs> that was the creation of Hyrule Field. The uh, idea of, we know this as like the hub, it's the Hyrule Field. Right. It's where everything else branches off of. They were just like, oh, we got to make a big space. It's interesting that Epona came first. Yes, I know. Like, it's kind of like the egg before the chicken. They, well, Miyamoto really wanted, so a lot of times Miyamoto will say weird things like he's interested in a mechanic. Let's try first person with Link. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just want there to be horseback riding. I think it's important. And, <laughs> and, need a horse. And usually his inspirations yield a very interesting game. I mean, honestly, even the Yoshi stuff came from a similar, he wanted a mount kind of mechanic in okay. Mario Brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just thought it'd be interesting. Also, a little side note, when Retro Studios was developing the next Metroid game for the GameCube back in like the early 2000s, Metroid Prime is what I'm speaking to, Mm -hmm. uh, speaking about, um, Miyamoto was still a consultant in many meetings while they were um, working on the game. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a moment, there's there's a documented moment in one of their meetings, Retro Studios, it was a second party company, you know, making this game. Uh, there was a moment where, and they were. This was a game where they were taking a two D side scroller and putting it into first person. In fact, Metroid might be the first of the three kind of big guys, the Mario, Metroid, Zelda parts of Nintendo. Mm-hmm. Metroid's the one that went first person. Zelda mm-hmm. went adventure. Mario stayed essentially side scroller. And there's kind of two different versions of Mario these days. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a quote where Miyamoto said in a meeting, so he was always curious about like the immersiveness of first person, I think. Mm-hmm. And he said in a meeting, he said, what if Samus had a bug head? And the team at Retro Studios were like, oh, very interesting. You know, I'm performing this. I'm kind of <laughs> I'm kind of interpreting this right. experience. But they were like, oh, cool. Yeah, okay, yeah, Samus has a a bug head. All right, we'll note that. We'll put that down. They later realized that um, there was a bit of some bit lost in translation. And what he was really saying is, what if she could see like a bug? What if she had different ways to view the world? Mm. And that's what became the different visor mechanics for um, Metroid Prime. Gotcha. So a lot of times he starts from like a weird place where he's just like, what What if there was a ho- I, what, I, you know, horseback riding? Right. Uh, seeing the world differently. And then, then a whole mechanic comes out of that. Okay. Cool. So Hyrule Field. So um, also the lead designer for... Yeah, the, the, there was a... Then they... Uh, Makoto Miyanaga became, uh, well, he was like one of the level designers and he became the lead designer for Hyrule Field then. And he said they built it and it was super boring. (laughs) He said it was terrible, quote, terribly uninteresting. Uh, There was barely anything in the Hyrule Field. 
Um, and so the designers planned to add, oh, there was nothing going on in Hyrule Field, and so they wanted to make it more interesting. So they then created the time mechanic. Not not time travel, but a day and night cycle. Right. Before that, the towns didn't have that. There was nothing like that. It was just always day or whatever. Uh-huh. So to make it slightly... Because remember, I've, I've you and I have talked about this in previous episodes... The Nintendo 64 can only handle so many polygons. And if you're gonna make a if you're gonna make a town, a building might be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, a really simple block with a triangle roof building might be 10 polygons. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're gonna put a door in there, it probably kicks up to like 30 polygons very quickly because you're doing all the different sides and the doorknob and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. 30 poly, you know, there's moments in Hyrule Field, as I'm sure you know, and I've said previously, where a hill is three polygons. Right. It's just like a massive little flat pyramid triangle right. out there because they had to really scale back because they needed to, let's say you could only get a thousand polygons out there or 500 polygons. They had to really be sparing with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was super boring. So they could only fit a couple trees out there. We know, we joke that Hyrule Field and Ocarina of Time is a bit sparse these days. <laughs> yeah. To, especially in comparison to other things. Yeah, not much going on out there. Not much going on. So to make it a little more interesting, they're like, well, we can't fix this with polygons. Let's fix it with kind of filters. Let's have a day-night cycle. Okay, we're in this boring piece of grass, but guess what? It feels a little different because it's evening now. And I think that worked. And monsters come yeah. out of the ground. And monsters come out. But on top of that, they were also going to have a temperature mechanic and an atmosphere mechanic. Ooh. That stuff didn't ever get really realized till Breath of the Wild. Right, right. 25 years later, 20 years later, yeah. whatever. But it was always there. The beginnings of that were always there. Interesting. Uh, finally, uh, that th- in 1997, Link did have a beam blade still. So if he was full hearts, he would shoot out like a, like a triangle thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it looked a bit like an arc, like a triangle arc. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else was happening? What else was happening? Epona did exist, as I said, but... You did not use the ocarina to call her because the ocarina didn't exist yet. Right. Can you guess what you used to call her? You still called her. Think, I mean. Think Twilight Princess. Right. I was going to say like a grass or a whistle. Yeah, it was just a whistle reed. Yeah. There's literally a sprite, a JPEG of a whistle reed. And there's a, there's like a there's like a screenshot of Link's block hand up against his face <laughs> holding a leaf. And that's how you call a Pona. Oh. And I remember in Twilight Princess, I remember thinking like, oh, Okay, so you called Epona with the ocarina in 64. That was super cool. I remember thinking like, oh, they really phoned in this Epona thing for Twilight Princess. You just pick a read and call her. It's so funny to know that actually that predates the ocarina. (laughs) So uh, last but not least, in this build, this is just before 1998. This is maybe like the second to final build of the game. Mm -hmm. The dungeons are starting to be made. There was... um, a, there was still the jump button, remember? I know I've been talking about this version of the build for quite a while. Mm-hmm. But you could um, do a jump attack even where you'd have to actually push A to jump and then roll to B to swipe your sword. So you could jump over enemies attacking you and attack them. Okay. Now, a jump attack wasn't ever truly realized until Skyward Sword. We could mm-hmm. jump side to side and mm-hmm. jump forward and stuff mm-hmm. like that with an actual, I think, literal kind of jump button. I think it was the A button mm-hmm. while you're in combat in Skyward Sword. Um, so... Basically, um, that was kind of the phase there of that part of the game. Now we're going to go to the final moments of this game. You might notice that there's a lot still missing from my story. Like, no ocarina, no young Yeah, <laughs> kind of this important. Is, yeah, this is, we're now in 1998. The game comes out this year. In November, yeah. yeah. Time's the ticking. So they made, oh, there's also screenshots of Adult Link in the Dodongo Cavern. I know you can go back in there as Adult Link, but but like mm-hmm. as you know, fighting the Dodongo and stuff like that. Okay. There's versions of Adult Link in a version of the Deku Tree, uh, because that was just what it was. So okay. So there's no Ocarina and there's no of time. <laughs> there's no. Wow, you're right. So yeah, there's an Epona, there's a Hyrule Field, and there's an Adult Link, and uh, v- pretty quickly they ended up removing the jump button, which I think was the final. There's like three big pillars in Zelda: Z targeting context sensitive buttons in a context aware character Mm -hmm. the auto jump the auto whatever roll not roll but you know what i mean like how link i've I've tried to talk about this in the past in other episodes but it's the idea that link's model actually has we'll call them sensors quote unquote in the game that feels for when a polygon stops and when it feels that a poly if if he's walking on a flat polygon and in that sensor that might be 500 pixels out in front of him. I don't even know if it's pixels. It might be vectors or units or whatever. Mm -hmm. Feels that polygon end, the program knows to execute a jump. That's how how that programming works. Gotcha. So he almost has like these little invisible robot 
sensors around him mm-hmm. to know to grab a wall or to, or to jump. Which is interesting because when we played Beyond Good and Evil, that was not part of the mechanic. The way Beyond Good and Evil did the jump is they would program the jump to the edges of the level. So when when Jade is running around, she didn't have those feelers. That's why you could have some walls that you could jump off and some you couldn't. It was mm-hmm. a little hard to tell. Right. In Zelda games, you know if you can jump off or not because you can. Right. You know what I mean? And you do. And if you can't, they put a little wall there, which makes it clear. Gotcha. Which I think is just awesome. Very clear level design. Mm-hmm. So um, the jump button goes away. I think that the jump button went away because, oh, the jump button got converted to a roll. You know what? That's what the A button does. Remember, if you're walking in a oh, yeah, time, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a roll. But if you're just standing there, it's then put you away. Put away. Yep. Roll seems like such a unneeded action, except mm-hmm. for like maybe kick, pick, picking up a little speed, mm-hmm. which was also kind of by accident. Yeah. Because um, it was like slightly faster than walking. Yes, with indeed. rolling. <laughs> I think I know why they switched it to rolling. When they went to the context aware link that would auto jump, and auto climb and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Imagine if you still could manually execute a jump and you're going to jump over off a cliff or something and you also still have these triggers trying to feel for an auto jump. If Link is in the air at the point where his, I guess, Z axis is right over a polygon and that would trigger an auto jump, I'm sure that that just became a heck of a mess fast. <laughs> there's, a, there's an auto jump executing while you're already in the air with mm-hmm. a jump. So how do you keep Link I'm positing this. How do you keep Link glued to the ground so that an auto jump looks realistic? You make him roll. Rolling. You know? Mm-hmm. I'm, I, I will guess. I am only guessing that I'm sure that that's where that came from. It's like once they built the – okay, I'm repeating myself. Let's keep going. <laughs> so this is where it all comes together. The game is – Coming together. Oh, Link at this point is still blinks yellow when he gets hit, which is kind of a reference to Zelda 2. Still, hmm. he would fast hyper like every time he got hit, it would go like full yellow, like no shading. Ugh. It was odd. Ah. It, it was less than pleasurable. I've seen video yeah. of it in my research. They they got rid of that. I think he just kind of turns red for a hot second and kind of goes back these days, or maybe mm. he just like falls back. I don't mm. really recall. Um, I, I think there's like yeah, kind of a red or kind of like a there's like a color that shows up kind of briefly like. Yeah, I think you're right. Flash. I think you're right. Um, Okay, so now, of course, we have to bring in Young Link. So it was, I don't remember, I don't know where the inspiration came from, but I don't know what came first, the Ocarina or Young Link, but let's just say it happened in this build. I'll speak about Young Link first. The team, seven years had gone by since A Link to the Past, Mm -hmm. and the team was starting to worry that creatively maybe not creatively, but maybe structurally had Ocarina of Time become a little too advanced compared to A Link to the Past in style of play, Mm -hmm. in tone, in everything. Mm -hmm. Um, Ocarina of Time, for its time, was kind of a freaky little dark game. I mean, there were moments that are super spooky in Mm -hmm. that game. And it was this adult Link. And we were going from pink hair sprite Link you know, which a link to the past we are learning is is plenty complicated. Its dungeons are definitely challenging, but it has a lighter tone to it. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. even the scary parts are pretty cartoony. They, I don't know who decided it or realized it, but it was thought of that maybe if the if the gamers who are theoretically coming off a link to the past, even though they're all seven years old or whatever, what if they start with a young link? And that was just, they were even considering like going to a full Young Link no matter what, but also all this adult stuff had already been made. They wanted to stick to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was Miyamoto or who, but I feel like it was Miyamoto in the interviews that I had read. They thought, well, what if it's both? What if we have a Young Link and an old Link? And what if the, the intro parts of the game, we start them off pretty easy. There's not a lot of complicated items. Mm -hmm. And they chose to have the time jump be seven years Because that was the real world jump from A Link to the Past to Ocarina. And so kind of subconsciously players would feel that the A Link to the Past link, which is obviously a different link, Mm -hmm. but would kind of grow up accordingly into Ocarina of Time. So they Miyamoto did say they chose seven years for that reason. That's cool. It had been seven years for the uh, game to pass by. Which now I just realized that if they would have made that decision halfway through the development, I don't know if it would have been seven years. Yeah. And that wouldn't have been like. They might have just picked ten by accident. Yeah, interesting. 
plus seven is such like a mythical number. You know, that's also convenient. That's true. It's kind of like a magical number. Yeah. I think. It took him from a kid into being a teenager, <clears throat> um, you know, adult, whatever. So um, so that's how Young Link came around. And they decided to take the first three dungeons. They reworked them just a little bit, turned them into what we know of as the three, I guess, dungeons. And um, then also at that time is when the medallions started to reshape. I wonder mm-hmm. if you got medallions in those first couple dungeons. Like, you know what I mean? Jabu Jabu. Did you get a Jabu Jabu medallion? Did it give you water stuff? We don't know. Yeah. I don't know right now. I'll have to read more interviews. Hmm. But um, this is also the time when the uh, cinematics start coming around. Mm-hmm. They started to decide there's a young link. They um, experimented with pre-rendered sequences. So like um, uh, Resident Evil, the original Resident Evil for PlayStation had that live action cutscene stuff. Final Fantasy, which was coming out around this time, is mm-hmm. famous for having pre-rendered cutscenes, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And of course that works really well in a CD-ROM system because CD-ROMs hold a ton of data but load slow. Cartridges hold a lot less data but load instantly, all things considered. Mm-hmm. They experimented with doing cutscenes for Ocarina of Time, and there is some evidence of this. There is a, there are screenshots. There's a demo out there of Link walking into. Have you ever heard of the Unicorn Fountain? Maybe we talked about this. I don't know. There's a Unicorn Fountain, and there's a Triforce. There's a Triforce, quote unquote, in Ocarina of Time. I don't think it's in the build anymore, but there are, because you never see like a floating Triforce in Ocarina of Time right there in front of you. Mm-hmm. But most it's just kind of represented on their hands. Mm-hmm. There are screenshots of a Link walking into a chamber, fully realized shadow projection on the ground. So not like the weird little leg shadows that we got oh, okay. in the game. Gotcha. You know, like like Breath of the Wild shadows, like an actual shadow of his shadow. Mm-hmm. Uh, he walks in and he looks at this Triforce and stuff like that. And that was an early experimentation with doing cutscenes. Now, they still had the polygon counts kind of low, so it would look like the game. Mm-hmm. Like the environments weren't super rendered or anything like that. So it kind of looked like the game. But they chose... Um, to not go that route. Some say it was for the some say it was for the fact that it couldn't fit on the cartridge, but Miyamoto said that absolutely wasn't the case at all. They wanted to have the player feel like they were more in control and they didn't want the player to feel like oh, I put the controller down now and watch a movie. Mm-hmm. So they purposely made all of the cutscenes in engine in game using the game camera. So the game camera okay, was yeah. robust enough that they were able to you know, offset enough X and Y's and Z numbers to have that thing zoom around and do whatever it needed to do. Hmm. And they saw, they felt that they built such a robust camera, they were able to create these cinematics. And we, have, in our Ocarina of Time episode, spoke to the fact that the cinematics were very cinematic, very mm-hmm. film-inspired. But you know? it wasn't so different looking that it took you out of the game. Right. And you're like, oh, movie now. Like, it was, yeah. Sometimes the only... Just like- yeah. Playing it. Please, yeah, yeah. Sometimes the only time you know you're back in the game is because like the HUD comes back in, you know, but the graphics were mm-hmm. all there. You never feel like you're out of it. And they said that was a choice. Um, Takumi Kawago, Kawagu was the head uh, designer for the cutscenes. And um, and he was the one that said actually that it was a priority for the player to feel that they were in the action. Mm-hmm. And so they were generated all in engine. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Because actually, now that I think about it, on the disk drive, they probably could have fit some of those cutscenes, pre-rendered stuff. So I will go back to the Ocarina. Let's do Ocarina. This yeah. is it. This is the Ocarina. We've done the of time. We, we have now, now it's Zelda 64 of time. Yep. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I imagine that somewhere in reworking these dungeons, maybe the medallions were used a slightly different way and they started prioritizing them differently. Maybe it became part of the narrative, how they were only attached to the six final dungeons, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know that part of the story. Mm-hmm. But I do know that this is the time that an Ocarina was developed. And there are screenshots of a not blue ocarina, of a normal kind of brown ocarina with like colored buttons on it. Hmm. The holes on the ocarina were colored to yellow, red, and blue, and green, like the the um, Nintendo 64 controller. Sure. IG Enuma joked, joked in an interview that I found that um, <clears throat> they chose an ocarina because they felt the Nintendo 64 controller kind of looked like an ocarina. No. <laughs> okay. I can yeah. see that. Yeah. They're like, what about an ocarina? <laughs> I'm sure that that was like a... Uh, uh, a popular instrument or whatever. You what, know? A, what about a three pronged <laughs> yeah. trident instrument? Yeah, right. Of some kind. I mean, the ocarina is a bit bulky. It has the thing sticking out right. on the bottom, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Uh, apparently, it's very difficult to play, by the way. 
in real life. You have to get, it's a bit like a flute where you have to get the way that the wind moves through just right. Uh, yeah, I've never tried to play one. I, no. I, I'm not the kind of Zelda fan that like has the ocarina at home. I know mm-hmm. a lot of, I think a lot of people may have one in some kind of fashion that right. are fans of the game, but yeah, I never, never got my hands on one. With an ocarina, it is a bit like a flute in that the noise comes from the air vibrating, I guess, on itself, you know, it curates mm. that. Whereas like a reed instrument, it's the it's the literal right. pieces of wood hitting mm-hmm. each other mm-hmm. or vibrating or whatever. So anyway, so the so they chose the ocarina, and that's when everything came into place. Uh, they realized, okay, you're gonna call ocarina, you're gonna learn music, you're gonna learn songs, you're gonna call Epona with your ocarina, you're gonna execute. All of the warping became part of the ocarina, mm-hmm. and um, the one thing is they did not put magic on the ocarina. They still kept that as the three things you get from the fairies. Yep. And so maybe they downgraded some other pieces of magic. Maybe some of that, maybe there was like a teleportation medallion and uh, they just ended up having that be a song. That I don't know. So at the final hour, the final year, Ocarina, Time Travel, Young Link. I mean, Epona was just about a year before that. Mm -hmm. It all came together and fit together and became the Ocarina of Time. Awesome. Super cool. Uh, Let's see. There were pre-orders. Um, it came out in in Japan. It came out in on November twenty first, nineteen ninety eight. Just a couple days later in America, mm-hmm. and then a couple month, about a month or two later in Europe and Australia. Back in December, um, I definitely pre ordered this. I don't know if you did or not. <laughs> no, because I didn't know about. You found it randomly, didn't you? I remember this story. Yeah. I just got a Nintendo 64 and then I I don't really remember how it is that I came to have this game. I don't know if it was Did you know of Zelda before Ocarina of Time? Like that it was I a didn't thing? play it. Yeah. So I had probably I, I'm sure I had heard of it, but I had never played it. I've I and I didn't really have friends that played it either. Um, so I don't know. It was just kind of like a random chance that I, I got this game. Yeah, it doesn't look like it was ever bundled with the game, so I would have had to buy it. I would have had to have bought it, bought it, buy bought it. it separately. Um, yeah. I, don't know. I was a junior in high school when the Nintendo 64 came out. I was a senior when Zelda 64 <laughs> came out, Ocarina of Time. Um, I did buy the magazines. I did read the articles. I remember the Space World article of the funky looking link that I showed mm. you. The like I tracked this game for years and years. <laughs> oh, wait, I guess I think the Nintendo 64 came out before my senior year. I think I was, I think I was in junior high when I was in junior high when my dad brought that article home about the project reality thing, mm-hmm. which then you got to fast forward about five years. Mm-hmm. I one this was I think this was the first game I've ever pre-ordered and perhaps only game. Aww. I went to a Toys R Us, <laughs> gave them my money, and I did get like the gold cartridge. I have it right here. Uh, this is the original. I have for our magical sword people who are watching the video version. This is the cartridge that I pre-ordered and got from a Toys R Us. Aww. take played, my money. Played it like crazy. It's in decent shape. It's a little faded on the. Uh, on the sticker oh, there. Jeez, it is heavy. Mm-hmm. It's a very full cartridge. I think yours is. Did did they eventually get lighter? Like so, there was a, a um, there were two modifications. There's like a 1.0 and a 1.2 version of the game where they made a couple changes. Mm-hmm. So it's possible that when they re- brought the game out again, kind of quietly re-released it as the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's possible the chips were smaller. Because I think mine is heavy, but I I don't know if it's that heavy. Like that's this a hefty cartridge. Yeah, this one feels completely full. Yeah. Anyways. Um, and just for the fun of it here, I brought the GameCube ver- release of it, the 3DS release. And I just picked up this DS um, holder the other day, and it was Ocarina Art, so I thought I'd bring it yeah. for our little set. Nice. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, let's see, let's see. It came out to, um, you know, tens of tens all over the place. EGM gave it a 10 of 10. Mm-hmm. Um, Edge, GameSpot. Nintendo Power gave it a 9.5 of 10, <laughs> which I think is hysterical. I, maybe we've talked about this before. Well, yeah, what was it lacking? I think they were just trying to be modest, honestly. <laughs> like if Nintendo Power is right. like, greatest game ever, people are like, That's all right, good. check yourself, Nintendo. That's pretty good. It is the fourth highest selling Nintendo 64 game. Absolutely. Ultimately. So it was a, it was a top seller the year it came out, mm-hmm. but ultimately for the entire library, Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, and GoldenEye uh, have sold more than it. I'm kind of surprised GoldenEye is above 
GoldenEye. I mean, it's a great game, but I'm surprised it sold more than Ocarina of Time. Well, it had about a year on on Ocarina. It came out about a year before, believe it or not. True. And GoldenEye was a slow burn. It came out and people liked it, but GoldenEye was one of those like games where a year, two, three years later, I went to college playing mm-hmm. GoldenEye. Mm-hmm. It was like, you know, a lot of kids talk about Halo and now even it's not even Halo. I, I don't even know if it's Fortnite or what it is, but like it was the game, maybe Mario Kart. Oh my gosh, the two that were over Zelda. Mm-hmm. Those were the two games that you'd get together with your friends yep. and play. Yep. Guys, girls and everything. Z- GoldenEye 007 was the game, I, the college that I went to, it was Columbia College in Chicago. We didn't have like a, a dorm exact kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It had some living areas, but it didn't have like the quad. Um, but I would go to other, I'd go to like UWM here in Milwaukee mm-hmm. and Flip and Gold and I would be in the common room yeah. set up. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I think Zelda was the game that people would go back, you know, Home go back to, to their play. room yeah. to play. Yeah. 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 Anyways, um, and Pokemon Stadium and Donkey Kong 64 were after that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's everything I have to say about it. That was awesome. Thank you for all that information. And obviously, like you <clears throat> said, there are interviews out there. I I do have some links to some of the interviews that I found, which I'll try to put in our show notes. If I can remember, I have them here at the bottom of my notes. But even just Googling the making of Ocarina of Time, you'll find some pretty great things. Sweet. Well, thank you so much for all that information. I definitely learned things. There were a couple things that were familiar to me that I think maybe we had glossed over in our review episode. But it was really cool to hear the whole story. I had no idea that, um, well, it was kind of fun to think that they were already thinking about a 3D Zelda before the Nintendo 64 existed. Yeah. They were going to maybe release it on the Super Nintendo. Wow. Seriously. <laughs> Whew. <laughs> But then Star Fox happened, you know, they were fine with that. And then Star Fox 2 happened, and then that got not released because of 64, and I'm sure that they moved over to 64 very quickly. But anyways, okay, cool. If you have any thoughts or comments about the making of Ocarina of Time, you can tweet to us at Another Zelda Pod. Um, you can certainly leave comments on our Instagram posts, or if you're listening or watching this on YouTube, leave comments there. If you're on Patreon, we will definitely see your comments, and we can't re- wait to read them. Magical Sword people, thank you for hanging out with us on the behind-the-scenes video version here of this episode. <laughs> And Kate, that might be everything. If people want to chat with me online, I am Raptor Paint at Twitter, Instagram, Discord, the rest. Where can people find you if they want to chat? I'm on the Instagram, and yeah, you can send me messages on there. My screen name is I Only Take Cat Pics. Marvelous, marvelous. Terribly outdated at this point in time because dog, but um, yeah. Indeed, that indeed. That is my name. You can go to our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com, where you can find links to some of our blog posts. There was a really nice, there was a beautiful little post that just came out that uh, Celeste put out. I don't know if you saw oh, yeah. it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ghost's Awakening. Yeah. Oh, it was touching. Um, where we have some blog posts. We have all of our show notes for all of our episodes. It might be fun to go back and listen to our actual Ocarina of Time episode. Yeah. Honestly, I would encourage people to go back and check out the Hyrule Fantasy episode that we did. I think it was episode 17 in season one. It was, it was kind of a cool prequel episode. I was certainly thinking of that episode while I was putting my notes together for this one. Mm-hmm. Kate, let's get out of here. All right. That was awesome. Thank I'll you see so you, much. I'll see you in two episodes. I'm meeting up with um, another 6-5 show, Studio Demand It's, man, Studio Demands It's T.C. DeWitt, mm-hmm. who hosts T.C. De, who hosts, stu- oh my gosh, I'm getting so tongue-tied. He and I are going to do, he's going to be a special guest. He's coming in from California. And so we thought we'd take advantage of that and, and get him on this show. And I'm going to go do a Studio Demands It episode about Zelda. Yeah. So if, Crossover. By the way, let's talk about that for a second. If you want to go subscribe to The Studio Demands It, it's another show that 6.5 Media makes. They're just, they're like on episode 18 of season one, new little show. Mm-hmm. Um, they basically try to do the impossible and pitch film ideas pretending that like a studio is demanding it i can't wait because i'm going to be a guest on their show and we're going to do a legend of zelda episode Mm -hmm. they already did a mario brothers episode like could you make a good mario movie i can't wait to do this because i personally think that there should not be a legend of zelda movie yeah so we're going to see if we can figure out a way to do one and have it be good interesting i have no idea i have no idea what's going to happen but we're recording that later okay kate we'll see you in two weeks and uh, what's the topic? It's like we are talking about um, the way that female characters are portrayed in the Legend of Zelda series. Just kind of a discussion about it, you know how how they have been portrayed, how maybe women would like them to be portrayed in the future, that kind of thing. So I love it. Cool discussion. I'll see you then for that. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye.